Hey YouTube family, it's Pastor Tony, and uh, today is December 30th. I pray you're doing well. We're going to continue our reading of the book of Revelation today, so get out your Bibles. We're going to jump into chapter 17 today. 17, we're going to be talking about the woman on the beast in the book of Hazon, commonly referred to as Revelation. All right, let's do it. And one of the seven messengers who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying to me, Come, I shall show you the judgment of the great whore sitting on many waters, with whom the sovereigns of the earth committed whoring, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her whoring. And he carried me away in the Ruach, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast covered with names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup filled with abominations and the filthiness of her whoring. And upon her forehead a great name written, a secret Babel, the great mother of the whores and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the Kodeshim and with the blood of the witnesses of Yeshua. And having seen her, I marveled, greatly marveled. And the messenger said to me, Why did you marvel? Let me explain to you the secret of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to come up out of the pit of the deep and goes to destruction. And those dwelling on the earth, whose names are not written in the book of high from the foundation of the world, shall marvel when they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Here is the mind having wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, which by the way, is Rome. There's a whole lot of types and shadows, a whole lot of imagery and scenery in this in this particular book. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, it is it is my belief that the uh, the great the Pope of Rome is the false prophet, and uh, the seven heads of this beast are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and those seven mountains are the hills that surround Rome. Verse 10, and there are seven sovereigns, five have fallen, and one is, and the other has not yet come. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he has to remain a little while. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven and goes to destruction. And the ten horns which you saw are ten sovereigns who have not yet received a reign, but receive authority as sovereigns with the beast for one hour. Now, what that is, that is ten rulers of ten coming kingdoms in the New World Order. You see, when the New World Order is going to be formed, and it's going to be, it's already forming, um, there will be ten districts, so to speak, of the world. And ten rulers will be given authority over each district. And those, of course, will give their power to the beast. Verse 13, they have one mind and they shall give their power and authority to the beast. They shall fight with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is a dome of masters and sovereign of sovereigns. And those with him are called and chosen and trustworthy. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the horse sits are peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. These are all people that are going to be following the beast, taking the mark of the beast. Verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these shall hate the whore and lay her waste and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. <clears throat> 
For Elohim gave it into their hearts to do his, his mind, to be one in mind, and to give their reign to the beast until the words of Elohim shall be accomplished. And the woman whom you saw is the great city heaven, sovereign over the sovereigns of the earth. Hmm. And the great woman, and the woman you saw is the great city heaven, sovereign over the sovereigns of the earth. Hmm. Sounds like Rome to me. So, let me just dive here into my study Bible and see what this thing has to say here. Okay. Now, in verse 1, it talks about the great prostitute. Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Who is the great prostitute? Not easy to identify. The great prostitute has been linked to Babylon, Rome, and Jerusalem. It may be that she symbolizes all cultures that are unfaithful to God. Interesting. Now, in verse 3, it talks about, There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. <clears throat> what is the scarlet beast? This beast is most likely the first beast. Talked about in chapter 13, verse 1. Scarlet is most likely used to symbolize blasphemy in contrast to the purity and faithfulness symbolized by the color white. Now, <clears throat> I think it's noteworthy to find out you look at any pictures of the Pope and all his minions, what, what do they wear? They clothe themselves in scarlet. Very interesting. Hmm. They don't fool me, not for a microsecond. Anyway. In what sense, in verse 3, uh, is the beast covered with blasphemous names? You know, what does that mean? You know, the, the beast is covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. Well, we already talked about that the seven heads are the seven hills that surround Rome. And the ten horns are the ten leaders that will come to power once the new world order is formed. They will be given ten districts around the planet. So, in what sense is the beast covered with blasphemous names? Now, blasphemy seems to be the primary feature of this beast's character. covered with blasphemous names suggests that the beast is completely and irrevocably opposed to God. Hmm. Yep. Definitely. Now, in verse 6, this is a little, uh, a little strange where it talks about uh, that the whore, that the beast is drunk on the blood of the saints. You know, what, what does that mean exactly? Since the great harlot talked about here is figurative, we would also view her blood drinking as symbolic. This image is also used in Isaiah chapter 34, 5 to 6, and chapter 49, verse 26. It is the grimmest kind of horror, evoking thoughts of cannibalism, such as in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 26 to 29. The euphoria some get from persecuting and killing Christians is likened to getting drunk from blood. You know, uh, I just think of the time in in, in uh, certain cities in the in the in the old days, Babylon. You know, uh, the Great Garden of Babylon. You know, the king would he would burn, he would dip Christians in oil and light them on fire and burn them as his um, candles in his garden, so he could see his garden at night, and uh, also. You know, the rulers of Rome, uh, back in the day, they would, you know, toss, of course, Christians to the lions and watch the lions tear them to pieces and they you know, um, burn them alive and stuff like that. It goes along with this, I believe. Those that are wicked, it's like getting drunk on other people's suffering. Now, hmm, let's see. 
Now in verse 14, it talks about um, the, uh, uh, the ten horns, which of course are the ten kingdoms that are to come. Um, they'll go out to make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. Now, will Christians be part of this war? The called, chosen, and faithful followers are on the Lord's side. True. Although it is not clear whether they are part of this war or simply spectators, some say these are believers who decided for Christ after the church is raptured and so they are still in the world. Those, those would be the uh, tribulation saints. Others say the raptured church will return to earth to be with the Lord at this time. Still others believe that Jesus will not come for his church until after the battle. Post-trib, which is incorrect. I'm not going to get into that. I should do a whole video on that. Pre-trib versus post-trib. And I'm not even going to put mid-trib in that, uh, that uh, argument because most people, uh, even mid-tribbers, tend to gravitate more to the post-trib. They don't believe that the Lord will take us away before um, it all goes down. Now, I've heard from so many people that, especially post-tribbers, uh, almost every post-tribber I have spoke to or, or uh, you know, texted back and forth has always said the same thing. I feel like I've got to go through stuff to prove myself to the Lord. Do you? Well, that's pride and vanity. You don't have to prove yourself to the Lord, okay? What Jesus Christ did for you on the cross did it all. See, you are denying the power of the cross, actually, if you believe in the post-trib. You know, and, and you guys can leave comments in the section. Uh, be nice, because I know there's a lot of you out there who are post-tribbers. But you are incorrect. I'll tell you right now. Uh, it's biblical. It's scriptural. I can show you 150 examples in the Bible of proving the pre-trib. And I'll do a whole video on that one day. Really get you guys fired up. Um, but, um, and, and, and most learned and schooled people of the Bible are pre-tribbers because they've read the Bible cover to cover, page to page, like I have. I think right now I'm on my 10th time reading the Bible. I get something new out of it every time. I've read the New Testament a lot more than the Old Testament. I'll tell you, I can tell you that right now. I don't know how many times I've read the New Testament, but, um, I've noticed most post-tribbers, they go on Matthew chapter uh, uh, 24. You know, immediately after the distress of those days, after the tribulation of those days, blah, 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 blah. Well, they're, they're mixing up the second coming and the rapture, which is incorrect theology. But most schooled theologians that have studied the Bible through and through, they all agree on the pre-trib. And... Um, like I said, there are over 150 examples in the Bible that prove the pre-trib. Um, I won't get into all that right now. I talked for like hours on that. But um, where was I going with all that? I guess I was just, you know, saying that if, you know, most post-tribbers believe that they have to go through the rapture to prove themselves to God. Or I've heard a lot of people say, um, I want to be on the earth after the rapture. Or, you know, I've had dreams and visions. Here comes that dreams and visions thing again. I've had dreams and visions of me being on the earth, me being left behind. God wanted me to be left behind so I could witness to others. You're hearing from the enemy, my friend, on that. Okay. If you're a Christian, you're saved. You've taken Jesus as your Savior. You're going in the rapture. Okay, what he did for you on the cross did it all. Okay, if you're left behind, it means you didn't know Jesus. You didn't have him as your personal savior. You weren't repenting daily and seeking him and reading his word, things like that. Okay, so, um, you know, if you feel like you've got to go through the tribulation in order to prove yourself to the Lord, um, then you are sinning because you 
are puffed up with pride, thinking that you can do something for the Lord. We, we cannot do anything for the Lord, okay? He did it all for us at Calvary on the cross. And I'm very passionate about that. And I'm very passionate about my pre-trib views because uh, well, number one is the truth. But number two, I do not deny the power of the cross. You know, it's the most important thing in this entire book. You know, what Jesus did for us. You know, it's all about Jesus. Without Jesus, we don't stand a chance. You know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Trust in Jesus, and you will be saved. And lastly, before I get off here, I just wanted to give a small encouragement to the bride. Because, um, well, today especially, I've been feeling a little down, i got to tell you. Hold on, excuse me for a second. Mm. A little coffee there. Um, I've been feeling a little impatient, i got to be honest with you, you know, about the Lord's return and about a few other things in my life. You know, as you know, God works in His timing, not our timing, and it always seems like it takes longer than we want it to. Um, but I'm reminded of the story of the Ten, wise vir the ten Virgins. Um, the Bible tells us that all ten of them became sleepy because the bridegroom tarried. So we know for a fact that Jesus is going to take longer than we think he's going to. You know, that's what that story tells us. The bridegroom was taking his time. He was taking longer than they thought he was going to take. So all ten of them fell asleep. But five of them were wise. They kept their oil full and their wicks trimmed. So when the bridegroom came, finally he came, which is what will happen. Jesus will finally come. Five were wise and five were foolish. Five of them gave up. Five of them said, he's not coming. Who knows when he's coming? He's not coming. We were all duped. The other five were... Um, the other five were patient and endured, kept their, uh, kept repenting. You know, this is what I'm saying to the bride of now. So keep your oil full and your wicks trimmed. Keep repenting daily. Keep reading your Bible daily. Keep seeking the Lord daily. And I know it's hard, man, because I want to give up sometimes. I'm human just like you are. Sometimes I want to be like, ugh. Are you kidding me? Lord, you're still not here? How much worse does it have to get? I mean, right now we've got, you know, flooding in Missouri. 13 million people are going to be evacuated because of the flooding. I don't know how many people have died. You know, I live here in Miami. Uh, it, today it's December 30th. It's 86 degrees here today. You know, world weather patterns have changed. You know, for the first time, in, I was just reading today, for the first time in recorded history, the North Pole has risen above the freezing temperature. It's never, it's never, it's always been below freezing. Hence why there's always ice up there. It got up to 37 degrees, I was reading. So the North Pole is, is cracking apart and melting. So we know we're in the season. We know that the bridegroom is tarrying. He's taking his time, and I think the reason for this is because it coincides and goes along with the Bible verse, when Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in you? Will you be a, one of the wise virgins, or will you be one of the foolish virgins? Okay, we've come too far now to give up, so stay strong, you know, uh, when you are weak, um, just pray to the Lord, you know, for, for help and for strength. And he'll strengthen you. Um, but we're, we're still waiting. And it's, it's frustrating. I'm right there with you. 
you know, in this in this world we live in, you know, I was, you know, I got to be honest, a couple hours ago, I was feeling really down, and I watched some videos here on YouTube about, you know, waiting on the Lord and being patient, stuff like that, and, you know, what to do when the Lord takes a long time and stuff, and, you know, this guy was saying, you know, in this world we live in now, you know, it's, you know, when you get on your computer, you know, and you hit enter, if it doesn't happen instantly, and, you know, you got to wait five whole seconds for a page to download, you, you get all bent out of shape. You know, you go to Starbucks and you got to wait three minutes for your caramel frappuccino. You know, you're all out of shape. You know, you go to the restaurant and you got to wait in line to pay. You're, you get out of shape. We've become an instant gratification society. And I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's a shame. It's really, it's really hard. Um, so just remain patient in the Lord. He is coming. Who knows when? I mean, I, I sure don't know when. No one knows the day or the hour. If someone tells you that the Lord is is, is coming next month or next week or next year, and they have a date, don't automatically don't believe them. Just dismiss that completely. You know, do I believe it's going to be uh, years? Whew, wow. Uh, I'd like to say no. I'd like to believe it's going to be weeks or months. But uh, I don't know if you'd have asked me two or three, four years ago when the rapture was going to happen, I would have said months. And here we are, still years and years and years later, we're still here. So um, our time is not the Lord's time. His not His time is not our time. You know. He is like, he is the good father. You know, he gives us what we need when we need it. So, um, so family, I hope this video has blessed you a little bit. I know I've rambled on a little bit here. I'm at 22 minutes. I tend to, I try to keep my videos under 20 minutes. Um, you know, that's why I don't watch a lot of people's videos that, uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say this. And if this is one of you, uh, you know, so be it. But if your videos are in the 25, 30 minute long, I won't watch them. Uh, I, I don't have time. Sorry, I, I follow like, you know, 50 people here on YouTube. I, if I watched every person's video every single day, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go to work. I wouldn't be able to do anything except watch videos on YouTube. You know, so, you know, and most people I've noticed that put out 30 minute videos, 20 minutes of it is just them rambling about the exact same thing they rambled about yesterday and the exact same thing they rambled about the day before. So that's just uh, fluff. I don't watch fluff. I don't have time for that. Anyway, I'm going to get off here because you can see I'm, I'm slightly um, frustrated and aggravated, so I, I pray that you pray for me. Um, I'm praying for you. I love you guys. So... Be blessed in the Lord, and um, we'll talk about chapter 18 next, the fall of Babylon, okay? I love you guys. God bless you.